I think the reason I was invited to be here, um, ironically enough, I don't know whether the people who invited me know this, but I think it's true, is that um, I'm very skeptic. I'm so skeptic that uh, my first reaction when I hear anybody claim anything is to think, hmm, that is nonsense. That, that's, that's my first reaction. Uh, I'm so skeptic that skeptics and believers think that I am a bloody believer. And in my crusade to skepticism, I ironically find myself speaking at Zen, um, which was not something I, I had expected before. So I'll share with you some of the things I am skeptic about. And I think the message at the end will be that if you're consistently and truly skeptic, you come to surprising conclusions. And to anticipate something I will conclude, I consider materialism an extraordinarily inflationary, unreasonable, and not skeptical enough metaphysics, a highly metaphysical approach to reality. So let me, let, let's go over this. Uh, let me tell you some of the things I'm skeptical about. This is how we normally see ourselves, right? As little entities, discrete entities, separate from the world, going about our lives, scanning the universe with our sense organs, like these two big eyes. And the scientific paradigm we live under today tells us that the real world is somewhere out there. It's outside of our subjective apprehension, outside of mind. And I use the word mind in the way I think most people here would use the word consciousness. I know that many of you prefer the term mind for rational thought, but I use it in the traditional philosophical sense, which is mind as the space of subjective experience, consciousness itself. I prefer the term mind because it would include the unconscious, but uh, let, let, let's not go into that. So this is outside of mind. This is outside of consciousness. It's an abstract universe of subatomic particles and, and energy fields. And we can detect some signals from this abstract world with our sense organs. And our brain then reconstructs a subjective reality within our heads. What most people don't really have in their minds uh, sufficiently enough is that according to the scientific paradigm today, this real world here outside of mind has no color, has no taste, has no feeling, no touch, no uh, nothing. None of the qualities of subjective experience. Why? Because subjective experience is generated by our brains. So it's not outside. There's no color outside. There's no sound outside. There's no shape that you can discern. You cannot visualize this because if you visualize, it's already a uh, subjective experience. And by definition, that's not it. The closest you can get to understanding what science, the scientific, philosophical, uh, scientific paradigm is telling us today is that th this is, the closest thing is a mathematical equation. It's pure abstraction. There is nothing more metaphysical than this. You cannot imagine a spiritual realm that is more metaphysical and abstract than this. Because this is fundamentally inaccessible in any direct way. A spiritual realm, at least you hope you can access someday through meditation, at least if you die. This, by definition, you can never access. You are locked inside your head. Your whole life is a dream inside your head, according to our way of seeing the world today, surprisingly enough. If you look up at the stars at night, the paradigm will tell you, literally, that your skull is above the stars. Because the stars you see are inside your head. That's literally what it means. If you grant that you exist in this world outside of experience, and so does everything else, you're forced to conclude that your entire reality is inside your head. You never escape it. Before we go on and say that this is lunacy, which, which we are going to do, we are going to do it in a few minutes. But before we do that, it's important to understand why we came to believe in this. There is extraordinary explanatory power in this incredible, incredibly metaphysical approach to reality, more metaphysical than any spiritual approach. And the explanatory power is this. This seems to explain why we share the same world. Because if this doesn't exist, and all reality is a domain of dreams, of pure subjective experience, why are we dreaming the same dream? How come it's all so coordinated and synchronized? This explains it. There is something 
outside the dream that modulates the dreams of us all, making it all synchronized. <coughs> so, if you follow this paradigm, what you have to accept is that all subjective experience, like if I see a chair, the color, the shape, everything, is brain activity inside my head. <coughs> I hope I can finish this. And indeed, there's a lot of correlation between measured brain activity and the subjective experience people report. So we can't dismiss this out of hand. There is empirical evidence for this. But the paradigm tells you that there is nothing to experience <coughs> other than activity in your brain. And there is evidence showing <coughs> that this is not true. There is evidence that breaks this, at least at first sight. And my claim is that there is an entire pattern of evidence, an ancient pattern of evidence that contradicts this. So let's explore that. <coughs> You've seen this ad nauseum already. This is a figure from the Carhart Harris psilocybin paper, which shows in blue that the psychedelic only reduces brain activity. It doesn't increase brain activity anywhere in the brain. Uh, you probably you may have seen a presentation yesterday by Mr. Weber. He showed a picture from the same paper with some areas in red. <coughs> and there was a discussion about an increase in brain activity. That is not correct. What you've seen there in red was an increase in functional coupling between two brain areas. That was not an increase in brain activity. That picture does not contradict what I'm telling you now. This paper has shown that there is only a decrease in brain activity if you use psychedelics. Yet, there is an enormous expansion of awareness. If awareness is brain activity, how, can, how come they go in opposite directions? One is reduced, the other one is increased. There's a lot of discussion around this paper, which is unfortunate, because it looks like this paper is the only evidence of this mismatch between brain activity and subjective experience. There is an entire pattern, however, in 2010, a paper was published in Neuron in which scientists reported on the results of an interesting experiment. They talked to people who were going to undergo brain surgery for the removal of tumors, and they talked to them before and after surgery to evaluate what they called a self-transcendence index, an index for how spiritual these people were, how much they felt connected to something that transcended themselves, to, to a broader transcendent reality, transcendent reality. <clears throat> and they've noticed that after surgery, after brain damage, after a compromise of usual, normal, ordinary brain function, self-transcendent increased, transcendence increased in people who suffered damage and didn't increase in controls, who did not suffer brain damage. That's extraordinary. How can an impairment of brain activity broaden your awareness, uh, allow you to identify yourself with a broader reality? That, that's unexpected. <clears throat> you can't dismiss any of these studies on its own. What I'm trying to convey to you, to you is that there is a much broader pattern here at work. This is from this year, a study of Brazilian mediums. It looks complicated. I'll walk you through this. They had two groups of volunteers less experienced mediums in blue. This is a nice word for controls, people who were not mediums at all. Okay? They just thought they were mediums. <clears throat> and experienced mediums in red. And they had these people write text without a trance state, just write a piece of text. And then go into a trance and write a piece of text that the mediums claimed was being downloaded from some transcendent order, whatever. I reserve ontological judgment on the origin of that. <laughs> then, then scored the complexity of the text. Uh, you can score the complexity of anything you write in terms of structure, you know, the use of grammatical con and syntactical construction and so on, <clears throat> vocabulary. And consistently, text written under trance was significantly more complex, harder to write. 
So if you stick these people under a brain scanner, what would you expect? That the brain will activate more if you're writing more complex text, because it demands more cognitive skills, more awareness. Sure enough, for the controls, in blue here, you see control text and trans text, cognitive, uh, cognitive activation in these brain areas increased, as you would expect. But for the experienced mediums, it consistently went down. So these guys were able to write much more complex text with less brain activity, more awareness, less brain activity. Again, puzzling. I'm not going to bother you with a complete literature review here. I'm just showing you papers from the last three years. There's much more to show you. And you don't need to go to science. Look at popular science magazine. It's not really a scientific magazine. <clears throat> there was a feature article this year uh, focused on cases of people who suffered brain damage. And as a result of that, uh, their potential was unlocked. They developed extraordinary artistic and technical skills. As a result of bullet wounds to the head, trauma, uh, the development of dementia, all kinds of things that impair brain activity, leading to broader awareness. If you have teenage kids, you probably heard of a dangerous game teenage play, teenagers play called the choking game. Have you heard of it? Basically, they, they choke themselves until the point of passing out, constricting blood flow to the brain. <clears throat> and they do that because they have unfathomable experiences of broadened awareness. It's like a drug. And it's addictive. So they do it again and again and again. Some of them die accidentally. This is a, a major problem in Western societies. <coughs> what do you think happens if you constrict blood flow to your brain? Brain activity reduces, but awareness broadens. Again, I really want to impress on you that there is a pattern here. So if you already are convinced, bear with me. I, I, I bore you a little bit more. Meditation, as Gary told, told us yesterday reduces brain activity in the default mode network and other key cognitive centers, but broadens awareness. Uh, pilots undergoing G-force tests, in which they are put in a centrifuge that spins at high speed and drains the blood out of their heads towards their feet. They pass out, but when they wake up, they report near-death experiences. Funnily enough, this result is used, uh, is used by materialists to claim that the brain generates the near-death experience. <coughs> they fail to see the pattern. Less brain activity leads to expanded awareness. Initiatory rituals around the world, sweat lodges, extreme physical exertion, poisoning, they focus on impairing physiological functioning throughout your body that will impair, impair your brain. Why do they do that? To give people insights about the true nature of reality to expand their awareness. <coughs> <coughs> there was a result a couple of years ago, or a little bit longer, early this century. In Switzerland, they used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which shuts down localized areas of the neocortex. They put a patient with epilepsy in one of those, and they shut down the singular gyrus, an area of the brain. And that induced an out-of-body experience. Again, expansion of awareness caused, I don't like this word, correlated with reduction of brain activity. Very surprising. So what's going on? We cannot dismiss this model out of hand because there are correlations between brain activity and subjective experience. So if we want to throw that away, we still have to explain these correlations. We cannot just dismiss it out of hand. We need an alternative if we are to, to be serious and honest. And that's what I'm going to propose to you, an alternative. <coughs> <coughs> Bear with me. Um, I'll do it in several slow steps because it it's, it's extremely simple. That's why it's difficult. It's so bloody simple that it's hard to see. So I try to lead you into a different way of seeing things, of seeing us, of seeing this room, of seeing your experience right now, which is extraordinarily simple, requires no spiritual skill, 
I have no Jedi powers. I have a very hardened brain. Uh, I don't have a spiritual teacher. I'm not on a spiritual path. None of that. Okay, you don't need any of that. Just try to follow me for the next 10 minutes. <clears throat> there is nothing extraordinary in this. Here's how it goes. When you see lightning in the sky, that beautiful image, when you see that, do you have any reason to believe that lightning is the cause of atmospheric electric discharge? Is lightning cause, causing electrical discharge? It's not. It's the way electrical discharge looks. It's the image of the process. It's not the cause of the process. I will not even say it's the consequence. I'll just say it's the image. It's the way it looks. There's nothing more to it. Flames. Are flames causing combustion? Or are flames the way combustion looks? It just looks. When it happens, it looks like flames. It's the way we register it. Right? One more example. <coughs> this is a blood cloth, a micrograph of a blood clot, clot. Sorry, a blood clot. This is an image of the process of coagulation. It's the image of a process. It's not causing coagulation. It's the image of it. It's the way it looks. And as an image, it is not the process. The process is this. You don't need to understand this. Okay, this is just uh, to give you a sense of what I mean. The image is not the process. When you see me, you see an image. You don't see me. There's stuff inside my body you don't see. You don't see my back. An image does not contain all relevant information about the process. It's a point of view on the process. It correlates with it, but it's not complete. It's not the cause. It's the way it looks from a certain point of view. So far, so good, right? Now think of a stream. Water flows unconstrained through the stream. But if there is a process of self-localization of water in the stream, then water stops flowing unconstrained and stays circling a certain point. It stays localized, self-localization. That process of self-localization of water in a stream has an image. It looks like something. We call it a whirlpool. There is nothing to the whirlpool but water. Yet you can point at it and say, there is a, whirl a whirlpool. It's discernible. You can even try to put boundaries on it and say, here the whirlpool ends. Right? You cannot lift the whirlpool out of water. Right? It's a pattern of water movement. It's the image of a process in water. My claim is that the body, I'll talk about the brain to be more specific, but this applies to the entire body, is a whirlpool in the stream of mind. Brain activity correlates with experience because it's the image of a self-localization process of mind. In the same way that a whirlpool is the image of a self-localization process in water. The brain doesn't generate the mind for exactly the same reason that the whirlpool doesn't generate water. You cannot lift the brain out of mind for the same reason that you can't lift the whirlpool out of water. Are you with me? Yet, because it's the image of the process, it correlates with the first-person view of consciousness. My consciousness, my individual consciousness, in my view, is a kind of whirlpool in the flow of mind. That's why my awareness is limited. It's localized, it circles around a certain point. I lose awareness of the stream. I lose awareness of the rest of what's going on in the universe. I have become localized. If you look at that process of localization, that is me, it will look to you in a certain way. And that's exactly what you see right now. It's my face, my body. If you crack open my skull and you look at my brain, that's the way it looks. In the same way that atmospheric electric, dis electric discharge will look like lightning, or that coagulation will look like clots. The image isn't the process. You're not seeing me. You're not seeing my awareness. 
in the same way that a clot is not the process of coagulation. It correlates with it, but it is not it. It's an image of it from your perspective. From my perspective, reality is going on all around me. I am the center of the world. I am right here, in the middle of the whirlpool. From your perspective, I am somewhere else. And you see my whirlpool as Bernardo, standing right here. Yeah? Now, we are not alone. So there are multiple whirlpools in the stream of mind. And there is something that we call reality outside of ourselves. How do we make sense of this, right? Uh, maybe we'll make it worse. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> now, notice that besides the whirlpools, there are all kinds of undulations in water. That will be a model for us of the rest of the stream of mind that is not localized. It's all one mind, but parts of it are not localized. They don't form whirlpools. That will be the rest of the world. That will be the rocks, the stars, the planets, whatever. Those undulations propagate through the water and they may penetrate multiple whirlpools, injecting the same information on multiple whirlpools. And we will perceive that once it penetrates our whirlpools. The rim of our whirlpools, our sense organs, our skin, our eyes, our ears. If these undulations from mind, from parts of mind that are not part of our process of self-localization, penetrate it, we will register it as an external reality outside of the control of our volition. Like the part of our minds that generates our nightmares. We don't have control over that, otherwise we would never have nightmares. Yet it's clearly in mind. Same thing here. The world seems to be outside of our control, seems to be separate. That doesn't mean it's not in mind. It only means it's not in our psychic structure. It's not in our whirlpools. And because whirlpools are dynamic processes, they leave an imprint. They emit undulations, they create disturbances in its surroundings. When I speak, I disturb the air. Air waves propagate, vibrations in those waves propagate. They reach our ears, they penetrate our whirlpools. That's why we can talk to each other. None of this requires this enormously abstract metaphysical world outside of subjective experience. This enormous leap of faith that is not only improvable, it's necessary. If there, ever, if there ever was a candidate to be sliced out of existence, existence by Occam's razor, it ought to be realism. It ought to be this lunatic notion that the real reality is outside of the only carrier of reality we can ever know, which is subjective experience. This is lunacy. We don't need a new physics to see the world in the way I'm proposing to you. Physics are our way to model the patterns and regularities of the undulations, undulations outside the whirlpools. By saying that everything is in mind, one is not saying that you can control all reality. Reality can still unfold according to very strict patterns and regularities totally outside the control of your ego. And we can model, discover and model those patterns and regularities. That's what we call science. None of this invalidates science. It's just a way of seeing. I'm not saying that you are whirlpools. You don't look anything like whirlpools. What I'm saying is that a whirlpool is a metaphoric way of seeing what you are. Undulations in the stream of mind is a metaphorical way of seeing photons, scent molecules, airway vibrations in the form of sounds. I'm not trying to replace the real images of reality with whirlpools and streams. I'm just trying to convey a way of seeing in it. Science is neutral as far as ways of seeing. Science just models uh, 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 phenomena and outcomes. The way you see that is up to you. It's ontology. It's philosophy. It's not science. Science is neutral about all this. So what I'm telling you is that this abstract world of some at subatomic particles and force fields outside of consciousness, outside of mind, is baloney. It's lunacy. The reason we believed in this is to explain the commonality of our experiences. But the moment we see reality as 
disturbances on the stream of mind, in the moment we see ourselves as self-localization process in processes in the stream of mind that look like human beings, we don't need that. Everything can be explained, all science can be transposed onto this philosophical framework without any loss whatsoever. So why are we going to believe in this, I'm, I'm tempted to call it a spiritual realm, but it's worse because the spiritual realm is accessible <laughs> and this isn't. Why are we going to double reality with this unfathomable abstraction of something that is fundamentally outside of our ability to ever experience, ever access directly? We don't need that. But if we are consistent, that is a fiction too. You also don't exist as a body uh, moving around outside this sphere of mind. If you think of it, look at your body. Everything you have, you have ever known about your body has been a subjective experience in your mind. If I palpate, palpate my torso right now, that's a subjective experience in my mind. If I see my image in the mirror, that's a subjective experience in my mind. So I ask you, what do I have more reason to believe in? That my mind is in my body or that my body is in my mind? Do you see? It, it, it's so obvious, it's painful. Uh, and yes, I have a consistent image uh, of myself because that self-localization process of mind has to have an image. A process has an image. Combustion looks like flames. Electrical, electrical discharge in the atmosphere looks like lightning. My self-localization process looks like this. And it happens to be the platform of my point of view, because it's the middle of my whirlpool. The world goes around it, so it's very consistent. If I walk, it walks with me. <laughs> right? There's, there's no big deal. There's nothing spiritual in what I'm telling you. All of this blah, blah, but forget it. It's obvious. All you have to do is eliminate the junk that culture and education has put in your mind. Eliminate all that junk. Go back to, to the fundamentals. Don't discard any of science. None of that's needed. It's pretty obvious. Oh, that's huh? No. Well, you know, we, you have an experience of yourself, and physicists have an abstract experience of atoms, molecules, and force fields. Where are they? They are there. That, that's all that exists. I don't, you know, to use the word dream may be too much, but in a sense, this is a collective dream. I mean, that, that's the most parsimonious, skeptical, logical interpretation of what's going on. There's absolutely no reason to postulate any more than this. So what I'm telling you is that this is what's going on. There is only the mental space. That's all there is. What we call the outside world, there are these disturbances here outside the whirlpools. I am here, you are there. That's, that's all that's going on. I'm, 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 I'm through, so I just, I just tell you one more thing, then I'll, then I'll take questions, okay? Uh, if my story was only what I told you now, I'll stop now because of time, but if my story was only this, you could shoot a hundred holes in this. Because if you think this through carefully and skeptically, all kinds of questions pop up. So that's not the whole story, it's only the essence of it, to make you want more. And if you want more, my fourth book is being published at the end of the year. <laughs> It has a very subtle title. <laughs> uh, so in the meantime, you can uh, keep in touch with me through these sites to, to get all the news. So I'll, I'll take questions now. If, if I can, uh, whoever the chairman is. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll take the gentleman with the, the red T-shirt. So you spent all this time uh, explaining that low brain activity is correlated with bigger experience. Which I don't Thank you. I don't even want to go there because I do. For all I know, maybe <laughs> there's different kind of functioning in the brain. You know what I'm saying? They're measuring the amount of oxygen or the number of whatevers. And what the hell does that have to do with anything? Thank okay. you. But, but what I want to know is why did you spend all this time on that, and how does that relate to your thesis? Yes. That, that's an excellent, excellent question. I was planning to talk about it, and I forgot, and I was distracted in my throat. <laughs> I didn't close my talk, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to finish my job. If a whirlpool is the image of a self-localization process 
of mind. In other words, if our brains are the image of mind self-localizing, and brains include brain activity. Brain activity is part of that image. If the localization is reduced, if there is some delocalization, then the image that corresponds to the localization should dissipate because there is less localization. The way it looks to us is less brain activity. Clearly, that's why, in many circumstances, less brain activity, which is a degeneration of this image of localization, correlates with an expansion of awareness. It's like the whirlpool is going slower, becoming bigger, and dissipating. That looks to us like less brain activity. And for very logical reasons, it corresponds to an expanded awareness of the subject. His whirlpool is becoming slower and bigger, less tight less localized. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, Bernardo, uh, bravo. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that, uh, that's uh, really brilliant. Uh, and it's so simple, it's exactly right. I just want to uh, put some, um, give you some more ammunition in what you're saying. Uh, the ultimate lunacy is the, uh, is the whole issue of uh, many worlds interpretation and multiverse. And the only metaphysical reason I believe it's, it's going on, there, there is postulating 10 to the 500 universes or more, one of which happens to have consciousness. So it's all random and we just happen to be in the right one. The reason it's, it's the ultimate lunacy is because basically they're trying to get consciousness out. And in the process, you have to postulate utter randomness and just one of those universes is ours. I, this, this is what, where Steve Hawking is going these days, and I think I, he finally went the deep end in some ways. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank um, you. Thank you. I, 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 let me be polite, because Thank this you. is a friendly, yeah. friendly conference. Uh, what do I say about this? I think there is a strong archetype in the human mind. Uh, let me put it another way. Scientists have been proven wrong in the past in very dramatic ways. They thought we were the center of the universe, and guess what, we are not. They thought that uh, life was some special energy called a uh, 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 vital force, and guess what, apparently it's not. So every time scientists over the past several hundred years tried to insert meaning in their view of the universe, they have proven themselves wrong to their own satisfaction. And they felt like idiots. They felt, like, they felt like trash. And I think it created an archetype in their minds, something that goes along the lines of, we will never let this happen again. And now it became an implicit, unconscious force in the mind of scientists, never to insert meaning in any part of their worldview anymore, for fear that they will be proven to be idiots again. Of course, none of that means that there is no meaning. It's the only the neurotic dynamics of human beings. I, I'll stop here because uh, the, I can get heated on this one. In uh, my world, we have uh, subjective emotions and objective thoughts. Uh, how does that uh, correlate to your reality? I see thoughts and emotions as two types of subjective experience. So to use my metaphor, both are undulations in the, in the stream of mind, if you will. Uh, I heard your question in the previous presentation, and I am with you. Emotions are more primary. There is a sense in which, okay, I, I, I see two primary needs in a human being. One is to experience, the other one is to understand. To experience, you need to be in it. To understand, you need to step out of it. Being in it is more authentic, more primal, more raw. And I think from that perspective, emotions are indeed more primal, and thoughts may be mechanisms for making sense and maybe even triggering new emotions. Well, uh, I'm not, no, I, I'll take from the back because he's raising his hand for a while. Uh, no, you with the blue T-shirt. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Really simple, I just wanted to thank you and appreciating the whirlpool 
um, metaphor or image uh, as we experience stress and we get wound up and then we want to unwind. And I think we all experience, when we experience stress, we notice how little we notice and the more self, so I just, I think on a really basic yeah. way, we can kind of prove your beautiful imagery. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah, uh, stress and anxiety can really uh, uh, contract us, make us very small in our apprehension here. Uh, I think that there, there was, uh, well, there were four people here. Yeah. What you say, which is very interesting, is very similar to what George Berkeley said, as you probably are aware, in the 18th century. Uh, there is a question to which he answered in two different ways, so I'm really curious about how you would uh, answer to this. Um, the question that his contemporary asked him about uh, the tree in the forest that nobody is perceiving. So what kind of existence does it have? Let me answer also a question you didn't ask, but which was nice in, in your introduction. I will answer that in a second. Um, Berkeley was an idealist, probably the first major famous idealist. Uh, I feel compelled to label myself as an, idea, as an idealist, no, in other words, somebody who believes that only the reality of mentality exists, not, nothing outside of subjective experience, uh, for the mere reason that materialists invented a concept of a world outside of mind, a world of outside of consciousness. If they hadn't invented that, I wouldn't need the word mind. It's just what there is. There's no need to invent a word for it. It's all there is. Daniel Dennett used, likes to say that, you know, you have heard about the hard problem of consciousness, the magic step that is required for matter to generate mind. Daniel Dennett always says, this problem doesn't exist. It's artificial. Yes, he's right. The problem doesn't exist. The, the, the error in my mind that he makes is that he denies this duality by saying that mind is an illusion, which of course raises the question, who the hell is having the illusion? Um, <laughs> instead of the obvious alternative, which is mind is all there is. So there is no hard problem of consciousness. The brain doesn't generate the mind for the same reason that a whirlpool doesn't generate water. It's all in mind. Now to go back to your question, if a, a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around, did the tree fall in the forest? My position is that uh, all subjective experience is real as such, and only subjective experience is real. That does not mean that all subjective experiences are the experiences of human egos. In other words, if there is a region in the medium of mind where the experience of the tree falling is registered, although no human ego was around to register it, Yes, it's still real, because it's a subjective experience. And then you can come to the question of whether the collective unconscious is in some ways conscious. I think it is. I don't think there exists an unconscious at all. So I think all reality is a subjective experience, but that does not mean that a human ego needs to experience it for it to be real. It's not in the whirlpool, but it's still in the stream. So it would be like the second answer by Berkeley, like God is the one who perceives the, the that falls in the forest. I'm not getting to the G word. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could say the tree hears itself fall. Um, <laughs> uh, which, uh, first I want to congratulate you on your elegant simplicity. Thank um, you. And then I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between self-localization and non-locality of the whole. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, but he, but he can do that. You see, he he he, do, he understands elegant simplicity. <laughs> you you understand the question? Yeah. Yeah. Just. <laughs> there has to be a mechanism in the self-localization process to make us quote unconscious of everything that's going on, because I am postulating that everything is going on in the same mind. So in principle, we should all have extrasensory perception of everything that is happening across space, time, and beyond. We don't. So there is something that is going on there. I do not have the time to get into that because it's the most complex part of my argument. It, it's in the book, but it's not in this presentation. But I would just suggest very briefly, it, it will not be satisfying, but it will give you a line of thought. Uh, 
when you look up to the sky at noon, you only see blue, you don't see the stars. But the stars are still there. The photons from the stars are still hitting your retina, just as they would at night. At night you would see them all, at noon you don't, but they are all still there and the light is still hitting your retina. It's just that they are obfuscated by a much stronger source of light, namely the sun refracting on the atmosphere. In my mind, there is no unconscious. There is only egoic obfuscation. So non-locality is with us all the time, but it's obfuscated because in the middle of that, that whirlpool, there is a self-referential process going on that amplifies the context of egoic awareness and obfuscates everything else, just like the stars at noon. It's all still there, but we are so taken by this loop of egoic awareness that amplifies mental contents, that you become aware that you're aware that you're aware that you're aware of something, that everything else is obfuscated. I, I don't have time to... to, 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 to